Good evening, everyone. Uh, I don't know how many folks we have on here. Uh, looks like you're you're slowly popping up on my screen. But this is the neighborhood leaders update. Um, some of you, I think, have likely been on some of the live with Lida updates. You probably know that. Sorry, we got a little background noise here. We, you probably know that every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at two o'clock, uh, I'm on Facebook Live, answering questions, giving an update with regard to uh, COVID-19. And so uh, we thought it would be a good idea just to reach out directly to neighborhood leaders in case you didn't know about the Live with Lida or in case that time of day was bad for you because you're at work or you're busy or whatever. So this one at 6.30 or maybe 6.33, hopefully is more convenient for, for some of you. I wanna give you a, a real quick update about where we've come. And then I'm going to have Dr. Eccles here uh, talk with you a little bit about what some of the numbers are right now and where we are in this cycle uh, so that uh, we can all sort of come to some common understanding. This won't take too long. I really do wanna to get to your questions. And about, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 people, maybe more than that by now have, have been uh, kind enough to send in uh, questions in advance. But what I thought we'd do when we get to those questions is take one that's sent in advance and maybe one that's live and just go back and forth so that we can uh, try to mix it up and give everybody an opportunity. So let me just say that, um, as, as you all know, back on March the 23rd, uh, the city of St. Louis and St. Louis County put a stay at home order in place because of the COVID-19 uh, worldwide pandemic. And since that time, we've done uh, many, many things, but the uh, end result of that, schools closed, non-essential businesses uh, closed. Of course, grocery stores, pharmacies, gas stations stayed open because we all need groceries, et cetera. Um, and the, the result of that is that we have pretty effectively tamped down the spread of COVID-19 in the St. Louis region. Now I say that knowing that, and I won't give you the exact numbers now, I'll give, leave that for Dr. Eccles, but knowing that two thirds of the cases in the state of Missouri, and Missouri has uh, almost 7,600 cases now, and two thirds of those cases are in the St. Louis region, which is St. Louis City, St. Louis County, and St. Charles is the, is the way we have defined that. So certainly for the state of Missouri, we have um, uh, by far uh, the highest number of cases right here in this region. So I know that this mandatory stay at home order has been hard on you. It's been hard on your kids. It's been hard on your neighbors and your families. But I also know that many of you are probably still going to work because there are so many people who work in essential services in the city alone, policemen, firemen, dispatchers, EMS workers, uh, water department workers, people who pick up the trash. Those are of course, essential workers, but also the grocery store workers, the, the checkers, the folks who bag your groceries, the folks who stock the shelves, those are essential workers. And then of course, healthcare and doctors, nurses, people who work in dietary and x-ray and housekeeping and all of the departments in those hospitals. So it has been um, over this last, it's about six weeks, not quite six weeks right now, uh, that since the stay at home order has been in place and uh, whether you're staying at home or whether you're having to go to work, this has been a pretty tough and a stressful situation for you. So with that, I think Dr. Eccles just, just came in and uh, I want to introduce you to Dr. Eccles for those of you who don't know him. He's been a, uh, on Live with Lida several times as well. Um, he is the head of our health department. He's a public health physician. We're very lucky to have him during this time, during this worldwide pandemic. Um, I think this is, a, this is a situation where none of us expected to be in this situation. This hasn't happened in our country for 100 years. Um, there have been other pandemics, but in our country, we have not been that involved for many, many years. So I'm going to step aside, give it a minute. Dr. Eccles will, uh, will come in behind me here, but we're all social distancing, as I hope uh, any of you are who are uh, watching from, from home. 
So uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm gonna introduce Dr. Eccles and then I'll be back. Uh, we'll both be back to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Eccles. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll start by giving an update on uh, where the city is as far as cases, COVID-19 cases. Um, so as of today, the city of St. Louis has, um, is reporting uh, 1,145 cases. Um, we're, not, we're monitoring 97 individuals for COVID-19, and today we've had um, 64 deaths reported in the city of St. Louis. Um, we've made significant progress as far as implementing um, social distancing measures, other preventive measures. Uh, individuals are starting to stay at home a little bit more than they were initially, and so we're starting to see the, the curve flatten. However, we still have a lot of work to do um, to slow the progression, to slow the spread of COVID-19 in our jurisdiction. We need the community to do that. Uh, the mayor has said time and time again, uh, the one thing that we have um, to fight COVID-19 right now is our behavior. And so doing those simple things like staying at home, especially if you're ill, um, only leaving home for those essential services, whether it's health care or um, food for your family, or uh, uh, health services for your pets or um, other family members, those critical services um, are approved as those are considered essential during this time. And so feel free to leave your homes for those services. However, uh, minimize your time in the community because we still have uh, COVID-19 spreading in our community. And so to protect yourself and your family and the community at large, we continue to urge you to stay at home. Um, over the weeks ahead, we'll still be, we'll continue to monitor the data to look at which populations are impacted. Um, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, um, the African-American community um, is, uh, have, is lifting the heaviest burden of COVID-19 in the city of St. Louis, uh, and that's not unique to the city. That's also been, been the experience in other jurisdictions across the United States. And so one of the things that the health department in the city of St. Louis is doing is identifying ways uh, that we can work diligently to ensure that we move forward as, uh, so we can properly address the health inequities and disparities that exist in our community. Um, the, these, uh, the disparities and inequities that exist um, did not happen overnight that were here before COVID-19 occurred. Uh, so we really have to do our due diligence to address these long-term um, issues that have uh, impacted health outcomes in our most vulnerable communities. Um, there, again, there's a lot of work to be done. The health department has started to engage non-traditional partners um, to lift some of the public health work. So really excited about being able to uh, partner with other agencies who typically have not been at the table um, to uh, help protect the lives of city of St. Louis residents and visitors. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. Uh, thank you all. I think um, if I could just say a couple more things and, and I haven't looked at the questions that you've sent in, but one of the things that we're working very uh, hard on right now is uh, trying to figure out when we can uh, lift the stay at home order. Uh, you probably know that the state of Missouri is um, lifting their order on, it's on Monday, this coming Monday, May the 4th. And the state of Missouri is a big, big state, 114 counties. They're very, very different from one another. Um, there are counties with just a few cases and there are counties like St. Louis City, St. Louis County and St. Charles who have thousands of cases. So the answer is not a one size fits all answer. And so on Monday the 4th, we will not be lifting the stay at home order here in St. Louis City or in St. Louis County. But we are looking forward to a day that we can do that in the not too distant future um, I, you know, I don't have the date because we're all going to do St. Louis County and St. Louis City are going to do this together. But it's, it is, uh, we think, based on looking at the data that we have right now, sometime in mid-May. Now, when we do lift the order, it's not going to be like a light switch, you know, on, off. It's going to be a phased approach, which still will require social distancing, six feet apart, still will, will require hand washing, still will require masks. I've got, I've got a bunch of different masks. We've got to wear these when we go out in public um, to the grocery store, to the pharmacy, et cetera. And so those things are going to be with us for a while. I don't see that we're going to be able, that we're going to be shaking hands anytime soon. Um, but 
I think what we are is that we're a couple of weeks away from that. Um, and, and so we're, we're working very hard to figure out what that looks like because we know that, um, that this is the, the health situation is very devastating, uh, particularly for um, the family, the, the individuals and the families who have contracted COVID-19. And I just read today, this was a new um, disclosure by the, uh, the St. Louis Metropolitan Pandemic Task Force that uh, there are almost 400 uh, healthcare workers who have also of course contracted COVID-19. So. Uh, at any rate, I wanted to just address that question right up front because it's the most asked question um, today. So should we, uh, should we take a question? And let me see, uh, how do we know if the hands are up here? Let's see. We do uh, have some hands. You have it? Okay. I don't, I'm not seeing it, but so we uh, Tanya and Jacob are. We have pre-submitted questions, Mayor, and then we'll have some live questions. We're going to rotate around. Okay, great. So starting on the topic of COVID-19, Amber is writing in from the 21st Ward, the O'Fallon Park neighborhood. Mm -hmm. She'd like to know if you see the August primary being postponed due to COVID-19 or at least conducted differently, maybe through mail-in ballots or absentee voting. Hi, Amber. I don't, I don't, what's Amber's last name? Do Amber we Cole. Amber Cole. Good, good to hear from you, Amber. I think we will be able to conduct the August primary uh, normally, but I wish, and I have been lobbying our state legislators to be able to have what's called no excuse absentee voting. In other words, now you can get an absentee ballot, but you have to either say, well, I'm gonna be out of town and unable to vote in, in town on that day, or I'm going to be sick, or maybe you're, uh, uh, confined, then that's excuse-based absentee uh, voting. I, I hope that we are able to get to a no excuse absentee voting for August, particularly um, for older folks, because we know COVID-19 is much more serious for older folks than, than younger folks, although younger folks are not immune. So I think we'll be able to conduct the August uh, primary pretty normally. Okay, Mayor, this is a live question that came in from one of your viewers tonight. They um, written anonymous attendee, so we don't have a name. <clears throat> okay, hi anonymous. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> what does the city feel about reopening performance venues like the Muni, the Rep, and the Symphony? When and if, when and if do you think it will be safe? I am so ready to go to one of those performance venues, but I don't think it's safe to do it right now. When will it be safe? These big venues like this, and that you're, you're listing off some um, uh, arts venues, but you, know, you could put sports venues in a similar category where you have thousands of people uh, next to one another. Uh, those will be later. Uh, those may come last. When you start thinking about what can open up first, what might be open, able to open up next. Right now, you know, we have a 10 person social gathering limit in place. And, you know, maybe next we'll go to 50 or 100 or, you know, but those are thousands. So that is a ways off, I'm, I'm sorry to say. So this is a pre-submitted question that could be either for you or Dr. Eccles. Mary Davis uh, wrote in from Walnut Park. Uh, Hi, Mary. With respect to COVID-19 testing, are they available for everyone now, whether or not they have symptoms? Uh, I'm going to give the short answer, which is no, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Eccles. You need me to repeat the question? Yes, you can repeat the question. Uh, Mary wrote in from Walnut Park, uh, and her question is with respect to COVID-19 testing, are they available for everyone right now, whether or not you're symptomatic? At this point in time, we don't have sufficient supplies of testing materials to offer to the general public. However, um, we are waiting um, to receive those materials. Once the testing resources are available, we will be opening it up to uh, the general public, regard regardless of whether or not they have symptoms. Thanks, Dr. Eccles. Uh, let's go to another pre-submitted question uh, still on uh, COVID-19. This is a question um, either for the mayor or Dr. Eccles uh, or possibly. Um, 
Mary is writing in from Dutchtown uh, with respect to masks for the public. Is there a way or, or has the city considered putting a call out some way to churches or other organizations to get masks, particularly to the less fortunate in our communities? So there are organizations that the city is working with to um, provide um, PPE, including masks, um, to the general public, particularly those who are uh, economically disenfranchised and may not have the financial means to purchase um, uh, the required materials. And so um, the health department working with um, uh, agencies from WashU, the Regional Health Commission, Integrated Health Network, and a variety of other partners um, uh, to make sure that this happens. And we're going to also be working with the Urban League of Metropolitan St. Louis uh, to distribute um, these materials um, to the general public over the upcoming weeks. Thanks, Dr. Eccles. Um, a question from Tower Grove East, Severin wrote in um, and asked, what took so long for the city to begin reporting positive cases in each zip code in terms of population? What was the date you did that? I think we did that on March, no. April 1st. Yeah. I think we did that on April 1st. Somebody was gonna look that up. It was, okay, April 1st. So that wasn't very long. So that's a great question actually. So uh, data is really important, but when it's not um, provided appropriately, um, it can do more harm than good. And so the city of St. Louis Department of Health was really working hard to make, to finalize our data because there were some missing gaps. Um, if you're familiar with communicable disease or public health reporting, um, there are certain demographic information that we require. However, when we receive some of the reports, some of the reports from private laboratories and even some medical providers, uh, a significant amount of demographic information was missing. And so uh, City of St. Louis Department of Health uh, epidemiologists as well as our communicable disease staff worked really hard to um, uh, uh, fill in the gaps. And so we, that's what took us along. We wanted to make sure we were able to, that we provided an accurate picture of what was actually happening uh, in the City of St. Louis. And so, and it was uh, published on April 1st. And so um, again, we wanna make sure that the community has accurate information so we can bring them along and they can understand why we're making certain decisions as it relates to um, uh, slowing the spread of COVID-19 in the city of St. Louis. Thank you, Dr. Eccles. Okay, we're gonna take another live question uh, relative to COVID-19. Michael Hebron is watching uh, and he just wrote in and asked, are masks currently a requirement or uh, a mask a request or is it mandated and how will it be enforced? So there's two things here, Michael. One, it is a requirement that businesses provide appropriate PPE, masks, maybe gloves, for their workers. That is a requirement that was put in place a couple of weeks ago uh, because PPE had become more uh, available. It is a strong recommendation that everyone who goes outside wears a mask if they're going to be in a situation with other people. Now you can go outside in your yard and that's fine. Uh, but if you're going to the grocery store or you're going to the pharmacy, you should be wearing a mask. It's for your protection, but it's also just a good neighbor thing to do. It's for the protection of other people. Okay, one more live question and then we do have some hands raised. So we're gonna do a live question. This person is writing as STL 63104. So 63104, all right. Uh, how is the city dealing with COVID-19 exposures for the homeless and unhoused individuals and any other transitory populations? So we have done medical screenings twice now for the individuals who are in the encampment on Market Street, uh, th but it's a voluntary thing. You can't make people uh, be subjected to medical procedures or screenings. But it is something that we're very concerned about, um, particularly when there is not social distancing. So we have partnered with Affinia Healthcare for some of that, and we have also partnered with BJC. Okay, we are going to take um, uh, one of the hands that are raised. Hands up, okay. This is from Miss uh, McCoy. Am I gonna be able to hear her? Where is Miss McCoy? There, she's right here. Can I hear her? How does this work, guys? We're trying to unmute her mic. So, Miss McCoy, hang on a minute. We're trying to unmute your mic. 
Need some technical assistance here. She may have herself muted. She's been, she's had her hand up for a while. So Miss McCoy, do you possibly have yourself muted? Okay, we can okay, maybe try to come back. We will try to come back to you. Um, um, can we take another yeah. live question? Joan Lipkin. Hi, Joan. Talk to me. Unmute her. Unmute. So. Oh. Hi, okay. Say it again, Joan, if you were talking. Sorry. Okay, I've been on enough of these calls all day. Um, thank you so much for all the work that you and your team are doing. Um, I was wondering if you could share with us what the issue is in, in terms of food insecurity mm. and uh, the change in, in the employment picture. Just give us some numbers so that those of us who really want to help will have a better idea of what the need is. Is that is my question clear? It is. Thank you, Joan. And I don't know if you all can see Joan, but she has uh, her picture with a little banner underneath it that says stay home. So thank you for that, Joan. So a couple of questions. With regard to unemployment, you know that there are 30 million people in the United States who have applied for unemployment. That's one in six of the working force, not one in six people, but the people that are in the workforce, one in six. So that's uh, ex extremely high and worrisome and has not been seen in, in many years. Um, and a related question of yours has to do with food insecurity. So the Regional Business Council has been working diligently with the, RB, with the um, Urban League uh, and they have done about six or seven food giveaways now, uh, some in St. Louis County, some in St. Louis City. Uh, many companies have contributed either food and or money for that. And it is not just food that people get, they also get uh, toiletries, they get some PPE masks. And so it's a pretty comprehensive package. Now, we do need more of that for people who, uh, if, if you wanna contribute to that effort, you can contribute to the Urban League. Uh, either food itself or, or dollars. Also, I guess this popped into my mind, you know, our food banks are really there, some of their um, stock has really been depleted. So uh, a couple of my neighbors who live a few blocks away are doing a food drive every Friday. Uh, people take canned goods or boxed goods, not perishables, uh, to the front porch of one person on the block they accumulate it and then the next day they take it to a food pantry. I think it's kind of a nice thing to do uh, and helps all of us if you're able, uh, helps you when you're doing a little shop, grocery shopping, shop for a little more so that you're able to uh, donate that to a food pantry. So on this topic, we're gonna to take a live question, Mayor. Christina Hazley is the president of the Urban League Federation of Block Units who's oh, watching live. Thank you, Christina. And we thank them for that. So her question is, is what can the block unit members do to help the city of St. Louis in the reduction of the spread of COVID-19? Block unit, block captains are so important. And thank you for being on this. One, you can help us communicate. Because even though I feel like I'm saying this information constantly about stay at home, wash your hands, don't touch your face, there are people who don't know that yet. And maybe they haven't heard it. Uh, or maybe they don't think it's serious, but you know, if you're a block captain or a block unit captain, your neighbors know you and they trust you. So communication is a really important thing that you can help us with because if you're reiterating, reiterating that message, they're, they're more likely to hear it from you uh, and actually internalize it than they are from me or, or someone else. So that's a big help. And then of course, um, be on the lookout for people that are on your block or in your group that, that might be in distress or need help. I think that's always an important job of a block captain and help to connect them with services. Uh, or as we talked a little bit before, maybe run a food drive in your, uh, on your block or in your, on, in your area. So we had a, a live question from Chris who was writing in and he'd like to know what the city's thoughts are on increasing curbside service for retail grocery stores during the pandemic, especially with COVID-19 being community spread. Well, um, curbside service is allowed now for both restaurants. I'm, I'm assuming you know that. I'm not sure I'm hearing the question right. 
but it's also allowed, you know, there are stores where you can order ahead. And if you don't want to have it delivered to your house, where they'll maybe uh, leave it on the front porch or the lobby of your apartment building, you can drive up to most stores and, and pick it up curbside. So uh, that's allowed now. Is that, that is the extent that of the, the question. question? That's allowed now. It's actually a great idea um, because it minimizes the interaction between you and, and an individual uh, worker. Do you want to take another live question? Sure. From a hand that's raised from yep. uh, Nick Finley has been waiting for quite some time. Hi, Nick. I'm sorry you're waiting. How are you? I'm good. No problem. Um, so a I, cup of coffee there? Something like that. Um, so, so I do have some concerns. Um, it seemed like um, we were a little slow to respond, uh, kind of waiting on Governor Parsons to make some decisions. And now seeing the decisions that he's making, I'm concerned that we might follow some of his decisions. So I'm hoping um, that you can reassure me that uh, the city is working independently of the state, uh, who seems to be jumping the gun on a lot of things. Um, can, can you speak to that? Yeah, Nick, absolutely. So I think we really led the way with the state because our stay at home order was put in place on the 23rd of March. The state's stay at home order was, oh gee, I don't know, three or four weeks later than that. So we really are leading the way and pushing the state um, in order to tamp down the spread of COVID-19. Now, recently, this past week, the governor announced that he is going to lift that stay at home order, allow businesses to go back to work with uh, social distancing and uh, on May the 4th, this coming Monday. That's not something that we're doing on Monday. We are looking at the numbers. We're looking at the numbers of cases, the new cases. We're also looking at the number of people in hospitals. And we're hopeful that within a couple of weeks, we can also uh, gradually, cautiously get back to work with a, really some very different work rules. But no, we're not following the lead of the governor on this. We didn't follow him initially. He, he kind of followed us. Um, so a pre-submitted question. This uh, is either for probably the mayor, Dr. Eccles. Courtney Curran is writing in from the Tiffany Park neighborhood and has a concern about city employees and would like to know what safety precautions the city is taking for health inspectors who are currently still having to work. Is it an option for health inspectors to work from home? I'll let Dr. Eccles take that question. You know, the health department is they are, they are doing tremendous work during all of this. So I'll just leave it at that and I'll let Dr. Eccles take the, the actual question. Do you need me to repeat it? Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. So this is from Courtney. She's uh, writing in from Tiffany Park. Uh, she'd like to know what safety precautions the city is taking for our health inspectors who are currently working. Is it an option ever for health inspectors to be able to work from home? Uh, so health inspections are, um, are conducted to protect the health and well-being of uh, city of St. Louis residents. So things such as food inspections are done to make sure that restaurants and uh, food service agencies are adhering to the food safety code to ensure that they are providing safe, preparing food safely uh, to prevent foodborne or food-related uh, illness in our communities. Um, so unfortunately, um, those uh, activities um, uh, must continue during this time. Um, and in, to not, in order to protect our staff, we're making sure they have access to appropriate PPE. So each staff has access to uh, face masks as well as gloves. Um, so when they go out into the field, they can properly protect themselves. Uh, they are also aware of social, social distancing requirements um, as well as other preventive measures. So uh, for example, if they're ill, they're um, asked to stay at home as well. Um, and so we wanna make sure our staff that are uh, working really hard to protect our community are also uh, safe and well. Thank you, Dr. Eccles. We're gonna take another hand raised question because uh, she's been waiting for quite some time. I don't know if it's for Dr. Eccles or the mayor, but we're gonna ask Amanda Davis to ask her question. Hi, Amanda. She unmuted? Hi, Amanda, are you muted? She might be muted on her end. On your end, maybe? Hi, my name is Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Hi. I'm thankful so much of your, um, you have invited us, the community leaders. My question is, when the zip codes that you have that has high numbers 
like 63115, which that's where I live, are we trying to find out why our numbers are higher in one area versus another? We are, I'm gonna let Dr. Eccles take that. Absolutely, that's a very important question. So when we look at um, the health inequities and disparities that exist in our community, uh, what we're seeing with COVID-19 is no different from what we see um, with other chronic diseases such as um, heart disease, uh, diabetes, uh, and asthma. And so what has to be done is that we have to have strategic plans in place to address these inequities, not for a temporary um, uh, point in time, for one point in time, but we have to um, implement solutions um, that are sustainable over time and that really empower our community to, uh, to work towards uh, self-sufficiency. Um, and another piece of that is also making sure there's equitable distribution of resources, whether it's health services, uh, other essential wraparound services, um, uh, so that individuals in those communities that are most vulnerable uh, have access to the services they need to um, live healthy lives. Thank you, Dr. Eccles. Uh, Mayor, we would like to go to a a pre-submitted question. There are a few people who wrote in from the gate district here in the city of St. Louis. Uh, they'd like the city to clarify uh, the, the way we are using the Buddha Rec Center as a temporary triage center for unhoused individuals. Mm -hmm. And was there any outside communication outside of city hall uh, in planning for that, including the uh, Alder Woman for the ward? So uh, Alderwoman Christine Ingracia suggested that about two weeks ago, I think it was the 14th or something of April, uh, we, we have a call three times a week with Alder people uh, at six o'clock. It usually goes for an hour or two. And one of the things that we have been trying to do is to expand the number of beds that are available for our homeless population. The reason that was needed, just as a little bit of background, is normally we have about 532 uh, homeless beds available in the city of St. Louis on any given day, not winter, but just any regular day. St. Louis County has about 300 beds available on a regular day. So when COVID-19 came on, these shelters at rightfully um, wanted to reduce their population because they didn't want everyone to be so close together. In addition to that, uh, shelter employees were reluctant um, and their volunteers were reluctant, who often are older people, and, and we know the impact of COVID. So that uh, put a couple of hundred people probably out of shelters and onto the street. So the city went to work uh, immediately to try to replace those beds and in spread out places so that we wouldn't have everyone together. So we have now have about 236 beds that we have added. Uh, you've read about some of these in the paper, Little Sisters of the Poor, which is uh, north on Florissant, uh, the Western Inn, which is at roughly Broadway and 70, the Mark Twain Hotel. Um, what am I missing here? Uh, uh, oh, Pastor Mike added about 75 beds in, in 25 in three different churches. Uh, and so we were looking for a place and, and the suggestion was that Booter, which is somewhat underutilized as a recreation center, uh, might be a good place. Now, we don't expect this to go on for very long. And if you live in that neighborhood, you've seen the number of trucks and workmen and workwomen who have been there. Um, you know, honestly, I, I think uh, Booter could have used some work long before now. Um, and so we were Saturday morning, this past Saturday morning was the first morning that we were there and we began seeing whether or not, you know, how much work needed to be done and whether or not it could be feasible. So that's, that's what, what you began to see. Um, so we do expect to have 30 ish people at Booter, um, and we, we will have a shelter manager there. We will have, uh, case managers there, we will have security there. Um, and I think, you know, I, I appreciate the, the concern that some neighbors may have um, in terms of having homeless folks there at the Booter Center, but uh, I think we're gonna get through this. And our goal is not to keep people in shelter. Our goal is to get people off the street, get them into shelter, then be able to move them into um, more permanent housing, either transitional housing or, or permanent supportive housing. Um, so that's our goal. Uh, we we have um, we had one other 
alderman who made a suggestion for a location out, out of 28 aldermen, we had two suggestions. Um, and that, that place that that other alderman suggested was not a place that we owned. And it wasn't, it turned out to be a place that just wasn't suitable. So we are using Booter short term. Some of you will remember that a few years ago, it was actually before I was the mayor, right as I was becoming the mayor, uh, we used 12, the 12th and Park Rec Center for a little while. Um, so uh, it, this is a temporary situation. A follow up for the mayor and Dr. Eccles. A couple of people <laughs> have written in from Fox Park, Central West End, Skinker to Bolivar neighborhoods. Uh, they're curious about why there was an order issued by the health department to disperse the market street tent encampments, especially in light of how the CDC addresses uh, encampments during the pandemic. Sure, I'm gonna let Dr. Eccles um, address that because it is a very serious health situation at the Market Street encampments. And these encampments have been there just for a few weeks and um, it, it's a pretty serious situation. So I'm gonna let Dr. Eccles answer that. The oh, sure. Dr. Eccles, I'll repeat the question. So uh, we had a couple of people write in from Fox Park, Central West End, Skinker to Bolivar. Uh, they're asking about the order that the health department issued to disperse the Market Street tent encampments. Uh, and they'd like to understand um, what the issue was there in light of the, the seat, what the CDC says uh, about encampments during the pandemic. I think that's a, a great question. Um, so this is a very a difficult decision for us to make. This is um, we will look at uh, individuals who are unhoused and realize that these are individuals who have lives, they have um, resources, et cetera. And so uh, when, we're looking at what, when we were looking at what happens um, or what's happening in uh, the encampments, we were finding that uh, the conditions were really unsafe. Um, there's evidence of rodent infestation, um, uh, other safety issues such as uh, substance misuse, um, et cetera, and constant traffic moving through those areas. So those individuals are at greater risk for uh, potentially contracting um, COVID-19. The CDC guidelines recommends leaving encampments alone if you don't have uh, shelter available for them. So the city of St. Louis has worked really hard over the last couple of weeks to not only identify additional uh, places where they can um, uh, shelter safely, but we've also been working with our community partners and stakeholders uh, to ensure that wraparound services are available to them um, so wraparound services such as substance abuse treatment, uh, behavioral health resources, uh, mental health services, um, primary care services, as well as um, COVID-19 testing. And so these services are essential for this population and we want to make sure that we're putting them in a better place, a safer place, um, so that they can function. In addition to that, the uh, temporary housing, as the mayor mentioned, is, that, is just that. We also um, have a, uh, another pipeline that we're working on uh, uh, for long-term solutions, which are really critical um, if we're serious about addressing uh, homelessness as an issue in the city of St. Louis. And we are very serious about addressing homelessness. Um, and so as we work to get um, individuals into temporary shelter and link them to case management and these other, other essential services, we'll also be working to uh, get them into more permanent housing as the mayor mentioned. Thanks, Dr. Eccles. Anything else on that, Mayor? Oh, I just didn't know before I moved on. Uh, we are no, it's a tough, it's a tough call, and um, you know, it's, you know, the the conditions there are really quite dire and quite dangerous, and um, so I really just appreciate how hard. Uh, Dr. Eccles and Will Pinckney and Valerie Russell and the Human Services Department and a lot of people have worked to try to pull this together to have medical screenings and to have wraparound services um, because we're, we're all committed to getting folks into better situations. So we have uh, a live question who also wrote in and she's been waiting a long time. I mm, think sorry. this is uh, Rachel uh, from Walnut Park West neighborhood, who uh, is watching and wrote in with questions about, I believe, cure violence. I think Rachel's up there right now. Rachel, I see her. Rachel, if your hand, if you are muted, please unmute yourself. Hello. There we go. We can hear you, Rachel. Yes, I had uh, two questions. Um, my first question was about the online absentee, absentee ballot um, to include the stay at home request as a reason to apply for absentee ballot. Would that be updated? 
hate it. Yes. I, are you talking about the August election? I'm, talk, I'm really speaking about the November. Any election is coming up. The November election is coming up. If yeah. we were, I'm hoping this will be over with by that time, but what if it's not? Yeah, I'm hoping this will be over by that time as well. If it isn't, certainly we'll have to make uh, some other provisions for voting. As I mentioned earlier, I'm really in favor of, of what's called no excuse absentee voting. In other mm -hmm. words, if you want to vote absentee, you request an absentee ballot and you get to vote absentee. Our state does not have that. Uh, and I really call on our legislators to to change that because it's not something that is with under the city's control. And outside of COVID-19, I'm really um, concerned about the Cure Violence Project. Will there be information on how much each ward would get funding to, to apply to this and exactly what actions will be taken? So the way the Cure Violence is working, we're, we're beginning with one area in the Wells Goodfellow neighborhood. And uh, it is, it's a combination of a project with the health department and um, yeah, employment connections. I'm sorry, I couldn't think of that for a minute. Employment connections. And they have been trying to hire the Cure Violence team. It's been uh, set back a little bit because of this stay at home order and because um, you know, it's hard to hard to work with people during the stay at home time. Uh, then there is another neighborhood, which is uh, I believe the RFP is out right now for that neighborhood. And where is that, Dr. Eccles? Is that? Um, we received a proposal. The proposal said they'd be against you, but they're being reviewed and evaluated by independent reviewers. What's the second neighborhood? Uh, Best Town and Walnut Park. Walnut Park. Yes. Yeah, so uh, that's what I thought. I wanted to make sure I check with Dr. Eccles. So it's Dutch Town and Walnut Park are the second two neighborhoods. Uh, Dr. Uh, Eccles just told me that we did receive proposals back from that and they are being in, uh, evaluated, I think right now by a, a team of independent evaluators. So uh, it, it's, it's on track, it's a little behind because of the pandemic, but it is still on track. And so the, the money is not by ward in that case, the money's by, by area, the three, the three starting neighborhoods. Okay, thank you, Rachel, for that question. This is another anonymous attendee who wrote in a live question. What assistance can the city offer to those who are unable to pay their rent on May 1st? And can you push Governor Parson for a statewide rent freeze? So two good questions. I, I, I certainly am, uh, would be in favor of a rent freeze. I don't think that I, we're going to be successful at that. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try. But one of the things that we are going to do, it, you know, we, we anticipate getting federal money, block grant money. Uh, we should be getting uh, a, a significant chunk of money from the state, which the state got from the federal government through the CARES Act. And in that, we are really going to uh, try to craft a rental assistance program and a utilities assistance program for people that are really in, in, dire, uh, in, in dire straits. So as much as we're working on the homeless situation, it's not all just about people who are already homeless. We have to make sure that we put some social services and some protections in place to prevent people from becoming homeless as well. Let's try, she put her hand back up. Let's try Miss McCoy again. All right. We've unmuted her if she's unmuted. Miss McCoy? Hi, I would like to know information in regards to um, the schools. And I know that they were thinking about putting masks and doing hand cleaning, and but I'm just really concerned about our young kids not able to keep masks on on a normal day. Yeah. And not keeping them on for a long time and do social distancing. So. Are we still looking for a remote learning coming forth or trying to, that just seems like a very sticky, unsafe situation, especially with hot, with allergies and that kind of thing with um, pre-existing condition with kids. So if you live in the city of St. Louis, and I'm, I'm assuming that you do, do we know, does Ms. McCoy live in the city? So if you live in the city of St. Louis or even St. Louis County for that matter, schools are closed for the rest of this semester. So that would, we're almost at May 1st right now. That would be about another month of regular regular school. So schools will be closed. Um, 
school, not all schools haven't made announcements yet about summer school, but I expect that summer school, if it happens at all, will look very different. It'll be more e-learning and, and that sort of thing. And I believe me, I know that puts a lot of that puts a lot of pressure on parents who are working and then trying to help their kids with their homework, et cetera. And perhaps we're hoping that by the fall semester, it starts what August, middle of August, that uh, kids will be able to go back to school, but there actually has not been a decision made about that yet. Uh, and when kids go back to school, whether or not they'll have to wear masks, we don't, we just don't know the answer to that yet. I hope not because I think that'll be a, a a real difficulty, um, but we just don't know the answer yet. What is it, May, June, July? Uh, so that's about three and a half months. And you know, this has only been going on for less than two months here in St. Louis. And just think of how different things are just in the last two months. So in another three and a half months, hopefully, hopefully uh, they won't have to wear masks, but we'll see. Here's a live question from Amanda Davis. Um, and this may be for Dr. Eccles or the mayor, but she'd like to know why are 24 hour gas stations not changing their hours, especially in zip codes with high COVID-19 numbers? So Amanda, I think we talked with Amanda earlier, didn't oh, did we? we? Okay, That's okay. I'm sorry. I, if we did, I, I think we did. But so um, they're not required to change their hours because there are people who work all kinds of shifts. You know, there are a whole lot of jobs that are not eight to five or nine to five. There are a whole lot of jobs where somebody has to go in at seven in the morning, gets off at three, goes in at three, gets off at 11, goes in 11, gets off at seven in the morning. So for those people, um, you know, we did not require gas stations or convenience stores to shut down at a certain hour. Now you probably know that grocery stores, many of the grocery stores in the area uh, are, have, they used to be 24 hours and now they're limiting their hours for, from 6 a.m. to say 10 p.m. But a lot of that was so that they could have time to restock their shelves and get new truckloads in and that sort of thing. So that's it. It's just that people work all different shifts and you know, we need to, they need to buy gas sometimes or buy things at convenience stores. Okay, this could be for a question for, uh, this was a pre-submitted question from Nathan, his last name getting cut off here, but he's from Dutchtown. Uh, the disproportionate- Nate Lindsay, I bet. It Maybe. says Nathan Asher. Okay. Ash, All right, Nathan. Asher. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, so the, the COVID nineteen has obviously had a disproportionate impact on our African American communities. His question is, when will we when will we begin to combat inequality every day in St. Louis by using racial equity to determine how we prioritize public spending long term? Nathan, we try to do that every day, honestly, and what. What we're doing now, there's no quick fix to this. We have decades and generations of inequities in housing, in job opportunities, in healthcare opportunities. Um, and we just have to continue to ask the question when we make a decision, who does this benefit? And try to make sure that it's benefiting folks who uh, need that benefit. This is uh, a live question, Mayor, and it came from an anonymous attendee. So there's a lot of you with the same name, <laughs> anonymous. <laughs> uh, so who knew? This goes to our stay-at-home order going past the states on March or on May the fourth. Cinco de Mayo is May mm. the fifth. What are the penalties that will be imposed on any bar owners or companies that violate the current orders of being closed uh, and the social distancing orders as well? Well. If you're in the city of St. Louis or St. Louis County, um, I'm sorry, but Cinco de Mayo is going to have to be at home for you. And I hope it's with just a couple of your family members uh, because our bars and restaurants are not going to be open on Cinco de Mayo. Um, you know, a lot of them were not open on St. Patrick's Day this year, another kind of big uh, celebration time, but they're, they're not going to be open on Cinco de Mayo. I'm, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to make your own guacamole. Okay, <laughs> another anonymous attendee wrote in a few minutes ago. So the city's extended stay at home order uh, requires essential businesses that are still operating to provide PPE. Does. Where should we report employers that are not providing PPE or requiring their employees or are requiring their employees to reuse PPE? Who's following up on these reports? Well, the health department will follow up on those reports. Their number is 657-1499. Uh, 
uh, or make a complaint through the Citizen Service Bureau. This is for the city of St. Louis, of course, which is 622-4800. Now, I would suggest, and I don't know if you work at this employer or not, but the first thing I would say to do, rather than, you know, turn them in, is to ask your ask your boss, at, say, I need PPE, do we have, it, let's just say it's a mask. Do we have masks? Some masks are made to be uh, worn more than once, some are not. And so, you know, I've been wearing the same yellow mask. Uh, I think it's in my, I think it's in my purse right now. I was gonna show it to you. I've been wearing it for a few days, but I'm the only one who has been wearing it. Um, I'm gonna have to get rid of it because I got lipstick on the thing. It looks kind of silly, but talk to your employer. I always think that that's the best approach. If that doesn't work, call 622-4800 and we'll follow up on it. Let's go back to a pre-submitted question. John F. submitted a question for you, Mayor Cruz, and he lives in the Panrose neighborhood. Hi, John. His question for you is pretty simple. What constitutes an essential employees? For instance, he doesn't understand why some, why some inspections are still happening uh, in the city of St. Louis. Well, John, I'm not sure what inspections you're talking about, but I'm gonna just say, maybe it's the building division. So our inspectors in the building division are still doing exterior inspections on, on buildings, um, citing buildings for uh, what's called minimum exterior building code violations. But what they are not doing is going inside any occupied house because it's just, you know, you don't wanna put an employee, a building inspector in a house with other people who they don't know, et cetera. So we stopped doing uh, interior building inspections. Usually that's, we call it a conservation inspection or an occupancy inspection sometimes. We stopped doing those a couple of months ago, six, seven weeks ago. Uh, outside, it's still okay. You can work outside, you can still uh, take a look at a building. And so I, I hope that answers your question because I'm not sure what kind of inspections you were talking about, but you know, we've taken that step to protect our employees and, and the folks that would be inside a house. Another pre-submitted question. This is from, and I hope I'm saying their name correctly, Tyrika. Uh, she lives in the Kingsway East uh, neighborhood, Fourth Ward, it looks like. Um, um, maybe, yeah. It's, it's cut off here. It says Fourth W, so okay. maybe she Hi, means Tyrika. Fourth Ward. Hi, Tyrika. How are you? Uh, so her question is, is obviously food supply isn't as stable as it once was these days. And can the city lift the ban on roosters so backyard chicken farmers can be more self-sustainable? Hmm. That's a good question. That's not a question I've had before. You know chickens are allowed, but roosters are not. And the reason that roosters are not is because of the noise they make. And we all live close together. And so roosters are sometimes not such welcome feathered friends. So I don't know if we're gonna change that rooster thing or not. It would be something that could be changed by the Board of Aldermen in an ordinance. Um, it, this is kind of a funny story, I'll make it quick. A neighbor of mine, and this is maybe 10 years ago, they had backyard chickens and um, they, they apparently got a rooster accidentally and they came over, the rooster was kind of mixed up though, it crowed every day about two o'clock, I don't know what the deal was there. And they were very apologetic about it. It really did not bother me. Um, of course, I'm most of the days I'm at work at two o'clock in the afternoon but it did bother some other neighbors. They ended up getting rid of the rooster, but they got the rooster on accident. Um, I'm, I'm actually not a chicken expert and I don't know how you tell a girl chicken from a boy chicken when they're chicks, but we'll see. A question from a viewer, a live question, Mayor, from a viewer who's identified themselves as STL63104. Uh, how is the city planning to offset the loss of sales tax revenue and will the bulk of that burden be borne by homeowners through increased property taxes? Mm. Well, the city's got a very sobering budget situation. About $30 million short in this year that we're in this last quarter. So, you know, April, May, June and probably $40 million short in next year. And those are really guesses. Um, we don't know what the impact for sure is going to be on sales tax. And the other big impact that we have 
is the earnings tax. And I know if you live or if you work in the city, you pay the earnings tax. And like you likely, you know, maybe you're you're not so thrilled about that, but about 40% of the city budget is in, in earnings tax and what's called payroll tax, which is paid by the employer. Um, and with people out of work, they're not, they don't have paychecks. That's bad for them. It's bad for the city because we don't have their earnings tax. Sales tax, if you're out of work, you don't spend as much. So you don't have as much sales tax. And when you have a stay at home order, that's really down. People aren't traveling, conventions are canceled. Um, baseball's canceled, hockey's canceled, items which are big uh, money makers. So the city's got, like almost every other city, the city's got uh, a money problem. So far, we have not received any funds from the federal government that would help us replace that tax revenue. So this is a long-winded answer, I'm sorry. Um, but we can't raise your property taxes without a vote of the people. So it's not that we're going to be able to just, you know, decide, oh, I think we'll raise property. We can't do that. People have to vote on increases in property taxes. That's, that's a good thing. Now, is, it, is this shortfall? Is this revenue, this money shortfall? Is it going to affect our services? Is it going to affect our employees? I mean, a huge percentage of our budget, probably 80% of our budget is in payroll. People's salaries and the benefits and pension and that sort of thing. So it, it's an issue, but we can't raise your property taxes without a vote of the people. All right, 7.30, final two questions, Mayor. Okay. Is it possible for you to expand EBT, SNAP, and WIC benefits to be accepted online so those recipients can also participate in safe social distancing while going to the grocery store? Um, I completely support that, but it isn't within my control. It's within, I, I believe this is, uh, and I've read some, some uh, information about this, that there is some consideration by the federal government to allow that. I hope that happens. Final question. Um, what are your thoughts, Mayor, on neighborhood events like outdoor concerts, other neighborhood-wide events for the duration of the summer? Will there be a limit on the number of attendees or how should neighborhoods in the city handle those kind of events moving forward? So right now, you can't have any social gathering with more than 10 people. I hope that before this summer is over, that will be lifted and the number will be up to at least 50 or maybe 100. But even if it is, and, and I, I think it will be if we can if we can do this sensibly and if we can continue to social socially distance, but even let's say it's a hundred and you're having a block party or something along those lines, even if it is, you've got to, to be socially distant. You gotta be six feet apart and you gotta wear masks. Uh, if you're talking about maybe music in a park, um, I know um, there are several parks around that have summer concerts. Um, you're going to have to wait until we're able to lift that social gathering. And then even then you're going to have to, uh, socially distance and wear a mask. So I hope we get there. I really do. Uh, I'm as, uh, you know, frustrated probably as you are, but I do know that it's the right thing to do. And the only reason that we haven't had a lot, lot more cases and a lot more people die is because you all have 99% of you have followed the guidelines, stayed at home when you could, as much as you could and socially distanced. And so really the credit goes to you. That's why we're in the position that we're in right now. So thank you to all of you who stayed at home and a huge thank you to all of you that are still going to work because you are an essential worker. I know that is tough. Both parts are tough. So thank you all. Uh, I hope you enjoyed um, this. I'm happy to do this again. Uh, or, and you know, you, you can, you can comment online if you want to do this another time and then we'll, we'll figure that out. Uh, I'd also be thrilled if any of you want to join the, what's called live with Lida. And those are generally usually at two o'clock Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Once in a while, we have to move the time, just watch Facebook or Twitter. Um, and, and I'd love for you to join that. That's an, another opportunity where we take questions and uh, we try to just keep everybody updated. So thank you all. I really appreciate you joining. 
I hope you um, hope you got your questions answered. I, I see there's a bunch more questions, so I know everybody didn't. So uh, we're happy to try to do this again next time. Next Live with Lida, it's tomorrow, actually, at 2 o'clock. So um, thank you all. Appreciate that you signing on tonight. Have a good evening. Enjoy the day.